All right. Um, Alex, if you'd like to kick us off, I think we're ready to start. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Wisniewski. I am the director for Kitsap County Parks Department. Um, before we begin the meeting, I'd like to start by acknowledging that uh, the Kitsap Peninsula is home of the sovereign Indian nations, namely the Squamish and Port Gamble Sklallam tribes. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I am very excited for our discussion today about ecological restoration. As you may know, we are currently engaged in developing a master plan for Port Gamble Forest Heritage Park and results from the first public meeting that we held back in March included a lot of comments and questions around forestry, restoration practices, and a strong, strong desire to protect and preserve everything that we have in the park. Uh, given this high volume of feedback around these uh, specific topics, we decided to create this bonus public meeting and invite experts representing various areas to share their thoughts and insights with us and with you. Um, before we jump in though, uh, I wanna recognize the fantastic team we have working on the master plan project. Uh, OAC Services is providing overarching project management. Fisher Bowman Partnership is leading the master plan project with Anchor QEA and Highland Economics. And additionally, we have, project steering, we have a project steering committee formed to help guide and provide insight from a more local perspective. This committee is made up of members of the Port Gamble Forest Heritage Park Stewardship Group, uh, our Parks Advisory Board, and other local and regional partners and residents. A big thank you to everyone who's involved, and thank you to all of those uh, on the call today joining us today. David? All right. Thank you, Alex. So before we get started, uh, we'll just review today's agenda. Um, we'll start off with a quick overview. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the master plan process that is occurring, but in case we have some new folks, we'll give a, a high level overview of where we're at uh, and why we're here today. Um, and then I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists and we'll get right into the discussion. Today's topic is regarding the ecological restoration of Port Gamble Forest Heritage Park. And then we'll wrap up that discussion about a half an hour before the end and we'll turn to the attendee questions. So throughout this presentation, if you do have questions, there is a little Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to click that, type in your question, and like I said, we'll address those at the end. So to start, uh, I do want to give a high-level overview. This is not going to be super in-depth, but I do want to bring some of the new folks on the call today up to speed with where we're at. Uh, Port Camel Forest Heritage Park is approximately 3,500 acres. It's in North Kitsap County, just south of the town of Port Gamble. So it's a pretty large area. And the purpose of this master plan and the intent of this park is to transition the former commercial timberland to um, a park, uh, a heritage park where it's preserved, uh, the natural resources are preserved and active recreation can uh, take place. Uh, the, the efforts to create this park are over a decade worth of effort. Uh, many partners have been working together uh, for more than a decade to make this park a reality, including the county, Pope Resources, now Rainier, both of the tribes, GPC, Forterra, and many other partners. Uh, the master planning process will predominantly take place throughout this year. It's approximately a, a year-long process, and we're just getting in the beginning of phase of the process. The intent of this master plan will be to protect and restore the natural areas, uh, evaluate strategies for that, and land management for access and recreation. We'll also be evaluating the economic benefits, uh, both direct such as revenue generating opportunities in the park, as well as indirect such as uh, you know, impacts to the local and regional community. This process is going to be community led. We have a steering committee made up of three folks who represent many of our partner organizations. We've been conducting direct outreach to many of these partners and we have four regular public meetings outside of today's panel session. We're nearly complete with the first phase of vision and programming of this park, 
and we'll be presenting that uh, the challenges and opportunities that we've uncovered to the public and, and learn more from you at a future event. So going into this master planning process, we have established the vision and the goals for this park. And they largely fall within the realm of the environment, education, providing access to the public and economic vitality to the community. The big reason why we're here today is to address some of the questions, as Alex mentioned, that we've received to date. So we had our first public meeting on March 16th and many of you gave us great feedback and we did hear a lot of feedback concerning the restoration and conservation of the park. So what we've done is we've reached out to many of our regional partners on the call here today and have asked them to come to present to you and speak on this subject and show you know, what it will take to restore and conserve this park as well as how it's going to fit with the other goals that we've established. So with that, I'm going to jump in to introducing our panelists and uh, then we'll go ahead and get started. And again, like I said, if you have questions, please feel free to enter those in the question and answers and we will address those after we've gone through the discussion. So first off, Arno Bergstrom is the Kitsap County Community Forester. Arno was Washington State University Extension Forester as well as Professor Emeritus with WSU School of the Environment for 35 years. And he is currently the County Community Forester uh, and has been for the past eight years. His focus is on the ecological management of the 11,000 acres that lie within the county parklands. Also joining us, Hans Daubenberger with the Port Gamble Squalum Tribe. He's their habitat biologist and research manager. Hans is a senior research scientist with the tribe. He's responsible for the tribe's research development, habitat and forestry programs. Within the habitat and forestry program, the tribe addresses off reservation habitat and forestry related issues. Under the research and development program, the tribe also conducts research and develops technologies and tools to guide restoration, remediation, and climate adaption activities. Roxanne Miles is the Pierce County Parks Director. Roxanne is the Director of Parks Department. She's been in the parks and recreation field for over 20 years, including 15 years as the Recreation and Business and Operations Manager for Metro Parks Tacoma, where she managed over, she currently manages over 5,000 acres of developed parklands and natural areas across Kits, uh, Pierce County, excuse me. Uh, she is also a professional grant writer and has a strong background in strategic planning, performance management, business planning, and public-private partnerships, which have been applied to the operations and expansion of the Pierce County Parks inventory. Kirk Hansen is the Northwest Natural Resource Group Director of Forestry. The Northwest Natural Resource Group specializes in ecological-based forestry and provides consulting, forest management planning, and commercial timber harvesting services to conservation-oriented forest owners across the Northwest. He's worked on behalf of small woodland owners for more than 25 years, bringing a passion for ecological forestry and simplified hands-on management practices. Kirk worked for six years with DNR's Small Forest Land Order Office before joining NNRG and also teaches ecological forestry as an adjunct instructor at Evergreen State College. Dr. Janice Bauman is a restoration ecologist and professor at Western Washington University and academic program director. Dr. Bauman is initiating projects that are focused on the restoration of coal mine landscapes in the Appalachian forests, the recovery of riparian forests in the Pacific Northwest, and reconstruction of estuaries in urban areas of the Western Washington peninsulas. Her research couples field methods with molecular, molecular techniques to better understand vegetation establishment, plant interactions, and system recovery in disturbed soils. Her research foci also includes below ground interactions of beneficial fungi during restoration, impact of invasive species on plant fungi mutualisms, and plant pathology within forest restoration. 
Nathan Daniel is Great Peninsula Conservancy's Executive Director. Nathan has dedicated himself to conserving ecologically valuable lands in our region since he joined GPC as Executive Director in 2019. He has over a decade of experience in nonprofit management, focusing on the protection and restoration of public lands. Much of his work is focused on connecting people to nature through community science programs. As the Regional Land Trust, Great Peninsula Conservancy works to protect most of the ecologically valuable lands of the Greater Penin Kitsap Peninsula and steward them in perpetuity. Hillary Wilson is Forterra's Program Manager with the in Impact Investment Team. Hillary develops and implements community engagement and government relations strategies. Over the past four years at Forterra, she has managed a large portfolio of real estate and conservation projects, including launching a successful grassroots campaign to raise three and a half million dollars to conserve over 3,000 acres on the Kinsap, Kitsap Peninsula, which is the park we're discussing today, and facilitating the acquisition, pre-development, financing, and community stakeholder engagement for transit-oriented developments in Seattle, Tukwila, and Tacoma. She is committed to expanding thoughtful relationships with community-based organizations, tribes, investors, and government agencies, and enjoys finding and implementing community-driven solutions to ensure long-term success and sustainability. Forterra helps restore forested public lands across the region and manages nearly 17,000 acres of Forterra-owned land and easements. And with that, Thank you to our panelists for joining us today. We definitely look forward to hearing from you, not myself, and uh, we'll jump into the first question. So I will address each of these questions and please respond approximately two minutes and we'll move on. So question number one, this is gonna go to Arno. What is the current condition of Port Gamble Forest? Okay, everyone can hear me, uh, got this image on the left is a historical drawing of the mill at Port Gamble and on the right is, portrays the current condition of, of some of the property at Port Gamble Forest Heritage Park. They, um, the old growth that was cut back in the 20s and 30s on what's now the park. And, um, and then, uh, then there was, uh, and it was naturally G uh, regenerated uh, naturally seeded in, and that was the second growth, and that was cut between it, across the uh, area of focus in terms of uh, uh, the park uh, where the timber deed is. Um, most of it was cut between 1978 and 1986, and so the trees you're looking at right now on the right hand of the slide represent that that age class somewhere in that range um, and and these trees were planted because of the tree planting requirements by the state of Washington and they were typically planted at around 300 and 350 trees per acre um, when the land was purchased uh, or the park was formed uh, part of the park the shoreline block uh, roughly 500 acres plus, including the Tidelands. That's the part right along Highway 104. The county uh, has title to both the land and the trees. So we're talking about the uplands area primarily um, where, where the timber deed occurs. Um, so far, approximately 500 acres have been clear cut uh, and and, and replanted and uh, nearly all of those acres and the trees have been, um, well, the land belongs to the county, it's part of the park, but the trees have been transferred to uh, parks or our control. Um, let's see, what else? The other thing I guess I wanna say about the current condition and then I'll quit with this. And that is, that, oh, you can actually see the seedlings in that shot. They're probably from 2017. Um, but the land is very, very fertile. Uh, there's a site index used, uh, three being average, one being fantastic. Uh, most of the land that we're talking about in the park is site one and two. And that has a lot to do with how quickly the trees grow and how big they get, how tall they get, uh, ultimately. The better the soil, uh, the more potential there is for 
big trees. All right. Both I used my two minutes up and plus. Thank you, Arno. Yep. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. Thank you for answering that. What is a healthy natural forest? And I'm gonna first turn this over to Janice. Yeah, I think you're muted, Janice. <laughs> You'd think I'd be used to this forum by now. <laughs> I keep doing that muting thing. Okay, uh, thank you, David. I, I kind of like to think of it more so as this in contrast to the current conditions out in the, the Port Gamble Forest where it's just a very simplistic structure, low diversity and all even age stands. And that's, that's completely different than what you would really find in a healthy forest that's either in, in old growth or on its way to old growth, where you have a, an, a, an amazing complexity within that forest stand. And that, that includes a wide range of, of species, both conifers and deciduous, all with different age groups, that also creates this nice diverse ground cover assemblage below, even a, a sub canopy strata. So you have this, this neat complexity within the canopy system alone, driven by biological diversity, different needle types, different leaf shapes, different branching structures, really diversifies the structure and complexity of a healthy natural forest stand here in, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, what you'll also find is abundance of dead trees, right? So, so in a normal forest um, situation, I, I like to refer to a term called dynamic equilibrium. Trees are falling, right? They're, they either have little disease or a wind throw. There's always uh, such a dynamicism going on within that forest stand that creates this large woody debris that, that creates this, this horizontal complexity as well within that, within that forest stand. So what you'll get in the end is, is a, a lot of dead wood lying on the ground that actually helps in, in, in nutrient cycling, uh, seed generation, um, a, a complex horizontal strata and a lot of diversity, not only in your plants, but in your fauna and also your fungi and lichens as well. So that's what you're going to find in, in a, a old growth or a forest that's on its way to old growth that is really termed healthy and dynamic. Yeah, and what I'd like to add to that is the, the forests uh, across the, the Heritage Park really were designed for a single purpose. Uh, they're an industrial plantation that was designed to produce timber. Uh, and under that design, they were uh, exceptional at serving that function. And that's a single function. And what Janice referred to is a natural forest and complex forest. There are many, many different ecosystem functions and ecosystem benefits that come out uh, of a more uh, naturally uh, developed forest. So one thing that I'd like to make clear is that the forests at the park here are not pristine old growth. Uh, they are an artificial structure intended, again, to serve a single function. And in the work of, uh, in, within ecological forestry that I do, uh, we've kind of swapped the term forest health for forest resilience. Uh, forest health oftentimes takes on a lot of anthropogenic connotations um, and instead, I think we really need to be, begin thinking about, are these forests resilient? In particular, are they resilient to climate change? And I would argue that these overly simplified, homogenous, single species, even age plantations uh, that currently comprise the park are not particularly resilient forests. They're very prone to fire, uh, very prone to pests and disease. Uh, and very prone to drought stress that will become an increasing concern uh, with climate change. Okay, anything else to add? I Please let me know if you want me to move the slides. I think well, we must. Well, thank you, David. Just, just <laughs> on that, and, and just to uh, really uh, ride on, on Kurt's point of resilience, when we think of that in those natural stands and those ecological processes and functions that they have, they ensure the sustainability and, and, and drive this biological diversity that, that aids in, in some type of species redundancy. So if you have a disease or a fire or a disturbance, which would really be a natural component of that 
landscape, you have the res resiliency of, of your forest functions to maintain then those ecological services such as clean water, stable soil, temperature moderation, clean air, wildlife habitat, aesthetic and recreation value, right? That's really connected to the park and the cultural value uh, that is able to be maintained in time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, third question. What kinds of ecosystems may have been supported by this land before European settler impact? And I will ask Hans to kick us off with this. All right, so yeah, that's perfect. So I wanna talk a little bit about a study uh, the tribe's habitat program conducted back in 2006 to kind of sort of address this question. It's not specific to the park, Heritage Park, but it is specific to Western Kitsap. Um, in 2006, uh, Ted Labby led a study uh, through the habitat, the tribe's habitat program to try and, and um, to the best of our ability, describe historic um, conditions in West Kitsap, forest, forest conditions in West Kitsap. And what, they, what he used was a combination of the 1910 timber cruises, which were done um, to base taxes, forest taxes um, in Washington state, and the eight, circa 1870 uh, general land office notes or surveys. Um, and with those two things, he was able to really describe the types of the different types of vegetation, different species composition, tree size, um, and, and distribution. And primarily, we we're looking at at the relationship, um, really focusing on riparian habitats in, in this particular context. But um, the the research sort of applies to all these forested forested areas. And what you're seeing in this map here is basically um, a size class of Douglas fir trees. And you can see near the riparian corridors, um, the size classes were really dramatically large. And, and the reason for this um, is that as you move away from these riparian areas, that there tends to be more a higher likelihood of uh, fire disturbance, stand replacement, fire disturbance kind of intervals. Within those riparian areas, um, you're looking at more of a three to 500 year or longer um, stand replacement type of characteristics. So you see these really, really large trees. So if you wanna switch slides for me, David. Um, what you can see there is the change in composition um, between current day, and this was again back in 2006, um, but, but relatively recent um, conditions versus those historical conditions. So from a species composition standpoint, um, and this is very true, I think is, is, is true on the in Heritage Park, there's a, a big shift from a, a dominance of conifers. And even in the wetter areas where we, where um, hardwoods were, were still prevalent in the, you know, back at the, uh, you know, 18, early 1800s, um, from a biomass standpoint, uh, conifers were still very dominant in those areas. So here you can see the shift um, from the 1870s from almost a 60% conifer don, dominance to um, that drops down in these riparian corridors in West Kitsap to almost 10%. And you're seeing that shift really dominated by alder and, and other hardwoods and some mixed stands. Uh, the other thing that you can see, of course, and this is not, shouldn't be surprising to anybody, but that huge shift in, in uh, stand age structure. So you're going from, in, particularly in these riparian corridors, which, the, which we do have, you know, if you think of the mar marine riparian corridor in the park and then the smaller stream systems and wetlands, um, you see the shift from 120 year old trees, but likely a lot of those trees in those near wetter habitats were approaching, you know, three to 500 years of age, um, shifting down to 
well, what we saw in the picture is probably 40 year old trees predominantly um, on the park, but in this particular study, 40 to 100, 100 year old trees. Okay, can you switch slides for me? So here's just a breakdown. This is kind of a historical composition um, from based on, on the, the data that we reviewed. Um, and you can see kind of these different, uh, so if you're looking at these different habitat types like estuaries or streams, these are the riparian quarters around these different things. And you can see that they're dominated by Douglas fir and red cedar, um, which if you switch to the next slide, you can see how that shifts. And this is a little bit hard to read, but basically what you're seeing here as you, as you move away from the stream, um, a, a stream bank, uh, you, you see a shift, a strong shift um, from the historic, which was dominated by cedar, particularly in those, those near bank habitats um, to all predominantly alder in West Kitsab. And that's just, I just, I guess that that's all I've got on that, but I wanted to share that information. It, it's a pretty remarkable resource to have um, these, those two documents. I think they may be underutilized, but uh, it, there's a lot of information uh, for those that are willing to go back into the archives and look through those, uh, the, both the, um, <clears throat> sorry, the timber, the 1910 uh, tax timber cruises and the um, the circa 19 or 1870s uh, general land surveys. Thank you, Hans. Janice? Yeah, uh, excellent, Hans. Thank you. And, and to kind of pull a term that you were using is that riparian habitat and how important that is uh, within the landscape. So I'm gonna just take a step back and think of forests as, as a puzzle piece to our watershed. And a watershed can be defined by the highest points that guide water down into a common zone or bay or, or river or stream or, or whatnot. So within that forest, then, then you'll have your riparian zones that have that tight relationship with streams and rivers and all of these pieces of vegetation really fit together nicely that, that enable healthy streams and healthy waters. And, and of course, we'll go into the protection and the conservation of our natural and our cultural resources, which of course would be salmon and shellfish, uh, it, just to name a few. And, and, and we can step back into the watershed and think of forestry and, and the, those timber and that biological diversity too with such excellent provisions. But I just like to kind of uh, attack on to what Hans, is saying, Hans was saying is that these forests are such key habitats and, and they're in the watershed and they house many other ecosystems such as your wetlands, your streams and your riparian zones. And these act as a buffering system. So forests themselves and those riparian forests, they're gonna influence how water is gonna move through the watershed. It's gonna protect that soil and filter water, create such uh, valuable wildlife corridors throughout those forest and riparian systems uh, that contributes to food webs and ultimately impact the rivers and near shore environment. So we can't say enough, healthy waters depend on healthy forests and healthy riparian areas. Great, thank you. Next question, how can we restore and conserve Port Gamble Forest while supporting the other park goals? And I'll ask that you start this, Roxanne. I think Hillary was gonna kick us off if you don't mind, David. Okay, go for it, Hillary. Sure, um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the work that David and the whole master planning team is leading because to really answer this question is to acknowledge that community engagement is key to developing a plan that is inclusive of both environmental and community benefit. So, you know, as David mentioned, I worked closely with the community and the county and the tribes on the initial acquisition, um, along with my colleagues at Forterra. And I got to see foresters and birders and mountain bikers and conservationists working together to educate each other, um, sharing ideas and brainstorming solutions to this very question. And I see many familiar names in the audience um, who've been part of this project from the very beginning. 
looking at you, Mark, um, and who stood around the table and who drew in habitat corridors on the trail maps. Um, and collectively, we were able to work toward the common goal of acquiring this contiguous land group but for habitat and access. And I think as we move to this next phase, um, education and participation by the community is, is so important. Um, and we can also look towards other examples where working lands, conservation, and recreation are coexisting. Um, for example, up in Galbraith Mountain in Bellingham. Um, and at Port Gamble, we can consider which areas are wetlands, which areas could be considered for higher recreational traffic, um, and think about how we educate users of the forest and how we educate in terms of how forest management is needed to transition a heavy working forest into a healthier forest. Um, Roxanne, did you? Sure, great. Uh, no, I think you've, you've highlighted that well. I mean, really that's the master plan process. All these goals are there and it, it is going to have to take segmenting the park really into those zones, right? Protecting the riparian that's been talked about, those key soils uh, as Arno described them, but there will already is some logging infrastructure, there is some topography and with a site this large to take that 3,500 acres um, and whether it's only probably would take 10% maybe um, of this to figure out what are those access points because People love beautiful, beautiful natural space, but you still have to figure out the visitor service size. How are they gonna get access to that? And with all these multiple interests that people have in the site, that's just all the more parties that are prepared to help develop it, take care of it. And then you have positive uses and you're also clear about keeping the priority uh, timber in place so it can become that old growth that's being talked about. You know, I think part of this is this is defined a park, right? And, and not just a natural preserve, though that's gonna be a huge part of the open space nature that is there. But in being a park, you have to think about what is the demand that needs to be served for the community? What are those active outdoor interests as well that have to fit in the site? So I may end up paraphrasing a little bit what both Hillary and Roxanne shared, but you know, I think one of the exciting opportunities with this is we really have the opportunity to define a very different paradigm of how forests are managed in the Northwest. Um, there is a, uh, a, an emerging science of ecologically based forestry. There is a community movement towards community forestry. And it's a very different approach to managing what historically were industrial forest lands in the Northwest. And if we can all agree that an active management approach is appropriate for this park, then the next question is, you know, how do we go about actively managing this forest? And here is a wonderful opportunity to create a model for both community-based and an ecologically-based approach to forest management. And I wanna highlight one uh, metric. Arno said that these plantations were planted at 350 trees per acre in some of the slides that Janice showed about old growth forests, old growth forests in, in this area, the dominant trees often were stocked at about 50 trees per acre. So if we wanna get from these dense plantations to old growth forest structure, uh, we need to manage our way there. And I think in the next question, we're gonna begin talking about some of those opportunities or strategies for actively managing to restore the ecosystem services that uh, Janice articulated. Thanks for the segue, Kirk. Yeah, and so, you know, you're, oh, do we, Go for it, Nate. Um, well, you know, I don't wanna take up the time here, but uh, it, it is interesting. Uh, you know, the question is based on, um, the question is how does the ecological restoration and then management of the property, um, so it does provide ecosystem services, which Kurt was just mentioning, you know, so the the wildlife that's in the, in the forest can thrive and the, the wildlife is, 
not just the animals, it's the plants too. It's the whole, the whole system, everything that's out there. Um, that's, so the question is how can that function along with uh, the other goals that we have for the park, which are laid out in the vision and goal statement. And you know, there are nine of them, but they've kind of boiled down to create a healthy functioning system for the, for the wildlife that's there. Uh, and that's really important, but also it is a county park, as we've mentioned, and, and so it's really important that um, people connect to that land. And those, uh, and then the third kind of goal, if you want to boil it down, is, is to make sure that this place is sustainable and is going to be here forever, or at least as long as we can make it uh, possible. And, and those are not mutually exclusive goals. In fact, uh, to my mind, uh, having worked with parks and, and doing ecological restoration for over a decade, um, they actually complement one another very well. Uh, if you don't get people out using the land, um, there you run a real risk. It's almost an existential risk to the forest that uh, somewhere down the line, 50 years from now, the people that are in charge of the parks that are kids today, if they'd ever build that ethic and understand the value of these wildlands, you may lose them. Even if there are protections and deeds of right placed on these lands, things change over time. And so it's really important that the community uh, ethic that we all have, and there's a hundred people here or so on this call today, we all care about the land. Um, we want to make sure that continues. And the only way you can do that, if you, if you restore the area and then you don't let people in there, you're in the long run, you're not really doing the, the, the park a benefit. So um, that's basically my point. So thanks. Thanks, Nate. Okay, next question. What types of ecological restoration techniques could be applied to Port Gamble Forest? I guess I'll lead off with that. Um, you, got, you got some slides there. Uh, one of the things I guess I want to reveal is that a portion of the park has already been actively managed using the science-based ecological treatment. Um, when you, if you have been in the park and parked at the main parking lot, it's often called the Bayview parking lot, and walked in past the gate uh, to the left and to the right, you'll see a relatively young stand of Douglas fir that was thinned in uh, 20, uh, 2016, 2017. That's in the old shoreline block, the, right, the very first part of what became a 3,500 acre park. And there was some thinning done to the south of that uh, in a 50 year old stand. And uh, really you can kind of see it all along some of those main roads. We'll just, you'll, you'll notice that the trees are more open. And um, and that's based on a program that, that, that I am, have been implementing. Um, and it has a technical term, variable density, variable density thinning, but really it's a very selective kind of random selective thinning process, removing the small trees, uh, leaving the biggest and best trees, and adding and, and leaving all the non-Douglas fir species, and then um, adding trees, uh, kind of fill in some gaps to, to, to try and uh, introduce more diversity uh, of species there. Um, the, uh, it, the process really involves, in, I think uh, Kirk has talked about it and, and kind of intimated it, but it, it's, it's a process over, that takes place over time and in terms of the recovery of the, the biology and the structure and the complexity of the, of the park, um, I think thought was well. We'll go in once and we'll thin it, and we're done. But quite honestly, reading some of the really more current research, uh, it may it may require multiple uh, thinnings on something like a 20, 20 year interval. It sounds very disruptive, but but that's to get it to that point where you are at a stage where you're done. You know, and you, you've got the complexity, and you've got big trees out there that can, you know, someday be 500 years old, something we can hardly comprehend. But uh, um, so they'll, they'll be, uh, you know, I think uh, like uh, different stages of, of active management. It usually starts with like this image shows um, 
on the slide where you have a young stand that's just starting to take over the land and um, and uh, in a little while you would go through there and the term is called pre-commercial thinning, you'd thin it and uh, take it down from 350 trees uh, down to maybe a couple hundred trees and then you let it grow further. But you we're, one of the things we're talking about is how do we how do we add complexity even at this stage? And there's, there's a lot of good ideas about how we can do that. Um, I think that's all I have other than what the others, Nate and Janice, might want to share. All right, thank you. Janice, do you want to speak next? Yeah, and, and Arno said it and I'll, I'll say it again. The beauty of this is not anyone on this panel will ever enjoy this forest, right? Because it, it, the, the actual forest development is going to take hundreds of years to get back yep. to that old growth scenario. So, so kudos to, to us in our in our long game, right? Um, but there are some techniques, some silver cultural techniques that can kind of help push these natural processes forward. And one thing is is forest thinning, and 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 we get as as folks in forest restoration. Uh, kind of yelled at sometimes by by having or, or implementing uh, thinning within restoration practices when folks see it as such a disturbance on that forest. However, forests establish and progress pushed by disturbance. Disturbance is the the norm in a forest setting, not not an exception. So some ways of really accelerating that development into old growth is to getting some of those those. Um, high, highly dense stands thinned out, allowing for the trees that are left behind to put on a lot of biomass in, in short periods of time. This is some work, the graph is, is showing some work we've, we've done. Now this, of course, we didn't do the thinning. This was 80 plus years ago um, in Miller Bay uh, Peninsula. So this is an area that gets very little rain, so very slow growth anyway. Um, but they showed after 80 years, uh, based on the control, that means that was four stands that had no thinning involved at all. They had a heavy uh, thinning and a moderate thinning. And after 80 years, they showed such a significant increase in dug fir basal diameter uh, that that is again you don't even need the stacks to run it but but we went ahead and, and pose that there so we see the impacts of forest thinning as as such a positive civil cultural way of accelerating this development into old growth Janice if I could just jump in on that and that on that point so you know what what happens in some of these forests where you they're overstocked is that you know the trees are all competing against one another for all these limiting factors like water and light um, they'll grow fast and if you're managing them on a 40 year rotation you know they're going to grow you're going to cut them down you're you're doing it for that reason um, but if we're trying to get to a, a nice uh, forest that's is you know big and old and healthy um, it really is important to go in and remove some of those trees and just drop them in place or you can harvest them but if you uh, don't do that they get in they get to this point that's called stalled succession uh, where they, they grow to a certain point but then they start competing there. And you, if you know, if you look at the tree rings, they, they're growing fast when they're young. And then all of a sudden you can have a hundred tree rings, hundred years of growth in just a few inches because they just slow down. So uh, that's a really dangerous state also because there's so many dead trees in the understory. They're so thick that um, you'll, you're really risking a huge conflagration, like a big fire that'll wipe the whole thing out. And then you're starting from scratch. So uh, to avoid that thinning plays a really important role. It would be different if we had a healthy, mature forest, then we wouldn't want to do that. But given the state of the park now, it's pretty important. Yeah, or, or it would do it itself, Nate. And, and I, I got to visit the whole rainforest a few years ago, and that was my first time. And what I kind of took me back, it wasn't a dark, dank forest. It was a forest of huge trees and big gaps in the canopy allowing for these differential growths. And, and that's what we want. And, and, and forest thinning sort of mocks those natural disturbances that are happening in the forest that allow for that regeneration and those different growth um, structures to occur. Another thing I, I'll tell you what we're working on, in fact, Nate and I are, are about to initiate a project about trying to figure out what types of, of vegetation can you companion plant in with trees to kind of, again, accelerate 
uh, the, the, the growth of these forests. And you want to do it. So it's a balance, right? You want to get your trees to start, but you don't want to sacrifice your soil resources, meaning you don't want to leave your soil exposed while you're growing these trees because that, that soil can wind or, or rain erode away. So uh, another part of this is companion planting. Um, spacing is important, knowing what shrubs to put with what trees and what, what herbaceous species to also companion plant in. And that's another way of getting a healthy start uh, to your trees. Here's a, some work we're doing out in, in the Elwha River where we're using lupin as, as a companion plant. And what we're finding in these areas of dense lupin cover, conifers are growing bigger, they're healthier, they have more nitrogen within their, their tissue. So we're seeing, you know, with the right companion plant, a real boost in, in growth potential within these, these young conifers. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just kind of add on to that. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is not just companion planting, but looking at genetic diversity within tree species um, and understory planting. So on the, on the reservation, we are experimenting with understory planting in some of our um, alder stands we have some fairly mature alder stands that are starting to senesce um, naturally. And what, what we're looking at is trying to um, take advantage of some of the existing old growth uh, seed potential in the Olympic uh, National Forest um, to try and capture, because I think we've talked about this a little bit. These are what, what you guys have in the park currently is primarily a plantation plantation forest, which is genetically very likely to be very similar um, Douglas fir genetics. And so we we're looking at trying to preserve some of the older old growth genetics um, in our forested areas. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate there's not a lot of lowland old growth forests in the Kitsap Peninsula that maybe have been specifically adapted to the types of soil and drainage that we have here. Um, but we're going to do the best that we can to kind of capture that. That's on the reservation. But it, it, it's something to consider, particularly with climate change. Um, the, the opportunity or the, the basically our, our hypothesis is that some of these older growth trees may have traits that make them a little bit less susceptible to uh, drought conditions or some of the other things that we might see with, with future climate change. And I also just wanted to step back, but just because I, I'm giving the kind of uh, not really a tribal perspective, but a little bit of a tribal perspective and talk about how important this forest and park is to the water quality of Port Gamble Bay and, and how really, really important um, that is to the, the Skalom tribe because their livelihood really depends on the marine resources that um, exist in Port Gamble Bay. Um, the water quality in there feeds not just shellfish like Pacific oysters and Olympia oysters, little neck clams, uh, butter clams, gooey duck, um, but it also drives kind of the primary producers and primary productivity in that bay. So Port Gamble Bay is really, really important for forage fish. It's, it, had up until very recently the dominant herring population in Puget Sound. Um, and it's also really important as a sand lance and surf smelt spawning habitat. And riparian forests play a big role in not just um, controlling kind of nutrient loading into um, the marine environment, but also they provide shade and, um, and structure and sediment um, sediment that forms beaches. So having that natural habitat in a significant part of the bay is really, really important um, to those resources. And I just kind of wanted to add that in there, even though it's not quite part of this section. Great. Uh, Janice, do you want to talk on the, this slide and the next one really yeah, quickly? Thank you. And, and Hans, thank you again for, for that cultural uh, perspective, particularly for the, the water natural resources and, and again, how important these forests are. Uh, another restoration strategy 
uh, boy, is, is mitigating compaction. And if, if you want a forest, don't plant a tree in, in a compacted area. You're just going to fail every time. In fact, you'll notice that compaction really favors invasion. So these invasive species don't care if, if your soil is compacted. They'll come in anyway. Um, so, so these roads that have been impacted um, or, or it, the heavy machinery that's in these, these forest stands, uh, before we totally say goodbye to the bulldozers, sometimes we need them to, upon restoration, to implement some deep soil tilling or ripping that gets a good meter or a meter or a half, uh, about four feet deep of, of nice loose uh, soil. As Arno said, the soil's good out there, but if it's compacted, uh, no way your forest trees aren't going to grow. So again, looking at some research that we've done out, and this is in, in Appalachia, looking at reforesting after coal mining in areas that are compacted, forget it. Don't, don't grow, don't even try to plant your tree. So our control was just heavily compacted, overrun by invasive species. Seedlings can't compete with that. But if you alleviate that compaction, even if some invasive species are present, that'll allow the tree to root deep, get their soil resources, and enable them to get up and over that competing vegetation over time. So uh, mitigate compaction is, is going to be an important restoration strategy on some roads. And then I can go into this, and, and, and I know other folks are, are more experienced at, at the restoration strategy of that large woody debris, uh, but it becomes, again, a natural component of old growth forests. We want it there. The worst thing we could do is fall trees and clear them out, but we want that woody debris. It's going to create these microsites that are going to be so important for the, the regeneration of seedlings. It'll create shade, it'll buffer from some of that Western or Southwestern exposure. It'll be able to, to retain moisture within the soil. It can protect from large herbivores because that will always be a problem in, in uh, restoration is, is also balancing your forest and you want the critters, right? But it, it's just critters, give us a few minutes. Uh, but these large woody debris can help structure to keep uh, herbivores away uh, from your forest trees. It gives great perching sites for birds that will do the planting for you, right? They'll come in, perch, and deposit a seed uh, within your restoration site. Uh, they'll mitigate any type of wind um, issues with, with establishment and, and, and also help with erosion control. And, um, and I know others have more experience on that too. Just to jump back in on that that last bit, you know, we're not dealing with a lot of significant stream systems on that site, but again, that marine right riparian corridor, you can see that picture there looks like uh, driftwood on a beach. That that type of wood on beaches provides shade. And for those of you who are not familiar, surf smelt and sand lamps are really important forage fish for the, basically the entire food web in, in Puget Sound. They are, uh, rely on having shaded environments uh, because they deposit their eggs in the upper inner tidal. So we're, we're talking right up at the, the upper portion of the beach is where they, they spawn. And having um, shade reduces morta egg mortality because it basically keeps the eggs from you know, desiccating or drying up during a sunny day. Before we go on to that too, I think it's, you know, m money for all this is an important part of the restoration strategy conversation is what, what all this costs, um, you know, in an ideal world, you could go in and you could uh, plant a, a really l luscious herbaceous layer that's underneath there and put a mid story in that's just full of all kinds of uh, neat deciduous plants that create all kinds of berries for the wildlife. Um, that's really expensive to do. Um, so you have to be judicious in what you spend your money on. And it also comes like, if, if money were not a factor, uh, some of those stands that we were talking about in Port Gamble, uh, you know, Forest Heritage Park, I know there's community efforts to save a lot of those trees. And I, in, in Great Peninsula Conservancy, fully supports that effort. It's a wonderful thing. And I think it's amazing that the community is coming together to do that. It's really important. Um, but even if there were millions of dollars in that fund, if you did protect every one of those trees, uh, you, know, you got to ask yourself, are you doing right by the, creating the best system? And, and the answer in my mind is really clearly no, you, you need to go in there and do some management of the land, uh, even if money's not a, a limiting factor. So, um, and that's just going to get us to a better state um, much quicker and, and help uh, mitigate for all those uh, other disturbances that we're scared of, like fire in particular. Any other further thoughts? I know we've got one more prepared question to go to, so. 
And yeah, and just lastly, invasive species. That's always going to be a, a management uh, regime within active restoration. Thank you. Okay, so last question, and then we'll uh, turn over to the attendee questions. So how can we plan for and implement the restoration of Port Gamble Forest? Well, I think you saw throughout the restoration strategies that obviously a site this large is going to need some form of phased approach that identifying the different zones and opportunities in the larger master plan will help educate how to move forward with that. One of the benefits of doing that way, there's, there's gonna be involvement. You're gonna to have to have community involvement to accomplish this, to get in and do the thinning, but then also working with resources like the Washington Trails Association and Department of Ecology's Conservation Corps and different groups who then really are the experts and are passionate about that particular zone and probably moving zone to zone and gradually increasing the access that as the forest is restored, putting in place those things that allow the public access at the same time. And so this site obviously is gonna need a very strong, uh, potentially a friends of Port Gamble Forest Park that can bring all the different interests together with a strong volunteer program. And because the, the forest is the long game, then also legacy programs that allow people to uh, give and invest in the long-term vision of the site will be very helpful. But there's a number of partners already on this call and moving forward that will have to be coming together as it goes uh, step by step each, uh, each part of the way. So I think it can definitely get there with everybody involved. And already you're hearing telling the story, what people have explained on this call is gonna be an important part as people visit that site to understand the story of what it is taking to restore the site. Yeah, an important part of any kind of forest management planning, regardless of the scale, if it's a five acre forest or a 3,500 acre forest, is developing a very comprehensive and long term forest management plan. And one of the benefits of that plan is it articulates the type of silviculture that's going to occur. Uh, Arno and Janice uh, have described different ways of uh, approaching forest management from more of an eco within more of an ecological context. And this management plan will provide those kinds of details and allow the community to you know, gain a better understanding of how forestry can be practiced uh, very differently than what you typically see out there and certainly what's happened uh, historically on this site. And just as important as a forest management plan is a long-term monitoring plan that goes along with this. As I mentioned earlier, using this forest as a demonstration site to showcase how forestry can be done differently, the variable density thinning that Arno mentioned, uh, extending the rotation age or growing older trees, monitoring their benefit on watershed hydrology, uh, looking at the different wildlife species that come in and sort of using the different complex structures, uh, snags and down logs that eventually are uh, managed for and recruited into this forest, all provide a wonderful opportunity to create a, you know, a whole new science of forest management that will benefit forest practitioners all across the region. So I really encourage you to think about this forest as a great demonstration site that will have benefits way outside of your own community. I mean, one thing the Northwest really, really needs is more models of ecologically based forestry. And this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to design and monitor, document and disseminate uh, principles of ecological forestry. Yeah, I'll just tag on to that too, just because, uh, and, and, you know, for, for Great Peninsula Conservancy, you know, we, we uh, just received a $2.9 million grant to, to protect the divide block, which is right by Port Gamble Forest Heritage Park, which is right by Grover's Creek Preserve, which is GPCs, which is right by North Kitsap Heritage Park. Uh, and so we're looking forward to working with uh, Dr. Bauman, Janice, uh, on, on, uh, and, and, and Arno to um, do exactly what Kurt is saying is, is look at how to best manage these properties and, and do a long-term monitoring and, and, and really, um, there's a lot of things to talk about there, but leave it at that. It's just really exciting to see such a wonderful wildlife corridor that goes uh, all the way across the, the, the peninsula. Uh, and I know that that's been a long time in the making and the community has been so engaged. It's just really great to see this all coming together. 
Thanks, Nate. Hans, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, you know, I, I guess one thing I would say is that invasives, I'm sure you guys are, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but invasives are really difficult, particularly in the early stage of forest regeneration. Um, I'm sure there are people on this call that have seen scotch broom sort of explode recently over the last, you know, few weeks, because it's that time of year. Um, and it, and it becomes very obvious. Um, and it, it's a very labor intensive thing to deal with. So, you know, we, we've done it on the reservation. If you, if you're not going to use I mean, frankly, once scotch broom gets to be the size that it is, even herbicides can be difficult as a technique. So what we've done on the reservation has been extremely labor intensive, but it has worked, which is basically cutting back or, or you know, the, once, the, once one of those, once you get enough scotch broom, then actually removing it becomes virtually impossible unless you have a really big volunteer core. Um, but we were able to establish our our most recent forest, which was harvested in 2006 on the reservation, um, using just mechanical removal. So we cut basically cut Scotch broom back. Um, so my only th thought here really is if you can um, get a good volunteer core, it might be your best method for for dealing with some of the those invasive issues. Um, but yeah, that's it, it, that, that is definitely going to be a challenge. Thank you. Arno? You're muted. There we yeah, go. I, I would add to that. I've, uh, I've been working for the last eight years and doing variable density thinning or selective thinning in our park system, including the shoreline portion of Fort Campbell Forest Heritage Park. Uh, started in Newberry. We have uh, some, I guess, early data. We have some permanent plots there that we've been monitoring. And a stand that was is now into it's on its way to 50. Um, and what we have observed with the issue of Scotch broom is uh, that when you can get the understory vegetation to really take hold and and thicken up, so you really have a a blanket that really has a, a kind of a squelching impact on the reemergence of Scotch broom. It's a site that's been pulled uh, multiple times with volunteers. And we're almost at the stage where we think if we uh, do it one more time, we might have it licked. So that, that's, that, that's a non-chemical approach to it. And it is very labor intensive. Um, going back to the actual, uh, you know, kind of plan thing, I, based on my, uh, I guess, continuous study of ecological forestry and uh, references in this new, a new publication on ecological silviculture, I think we, we really need to set a goal for Fort Gamble and really any of our properties that we're trying to restore in the range of 150 years. Um, that doesn't mean it won't be revisited by the next generation or multiple generations as time goes along, but we need to really set our sights out there. Traditionally, and I think Kirk would agree with me, we, the tendency, the tradition is to do like a 10 year plan. And then every 10 years you, you know, reevaluate it and update it and, and all like that. But we need like 15 of those <laughs> is basically what I'm saying, 15, 10 year plans. And that'll keep people busy, but um, it's so short. Short uh, short-term planning is is very important, um, but I think we need we need to set that goal out there. And and I think with this master planning process, it's an opportune time to do that. To kind of say we want really big trees. I'll remind you one thing that I read in uh, materials from uh, Washington uh, Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the, uh, a tree that's a conifer or any conifer that's 20 inches in diameter is is considered a priority habitat tree. In other words, big trees are good for wildlife. Janice talked about it. Some of us have mentioned that. 
And that's what people want. They want, they want, everybody wants to see big trees, whether you want to call them old growth or just simply old trees that are out there that are hundreds of years old. And, uh, and I, I think we can do that. I really do. Great, thank you. So we've got about 25 minutes left and we've got a lot of questions. Right now I'm looking at 26. I don't know if we're gonna to get to all of them. I will say that um, I will distribute the remaining questions that we can't answer to the panel so that we can get some and we'll have those posted on the webpage. I will go in order of receiving them and ask that our panelists help provide an answer. So first question, from the audience, can the forest be developed toward an old growth forest? Yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, and it takes more than time though. Uh, it takes active management. I think one of the questions I'm often asked is, what if we just do nothing? You know, will these forests, you know, naturally succeed to old growth? And the answer is, well, maybe. Um, Janice talked a bit about natural disturbance events and, and how they shape forest composition, be it fire, wind, uh, ice storms, disease, et cetera. Uh, you know, all of those eventually will unravel these homogenous plantations and lead towards uh, old growth conditions. But you have to pass through a period of very, very high risk. And the biggest risk is fire. So by taking an active management approach, we accomplish multiple things. Uh, we can reduce some of the negative impacts of these natural disturbance regimes, in particular fire. Uh, we can speed up or accelerate the development of old growth functions you know, by committing more resources to fewer trees. Those trees will grow bigger, faster. Um, and along the process of thinning, we also generate important revenue that can be used to, to continue uh, to fund these restoration activities. So we can accelerate old growth through active management, uh, but it's still gonna take time. It sounds like this park is gonna be committed uh, to being a park for the long term, so you have that in your favor. Um, but like I, and I'll, I'll keep, keep saying this, keep underscoring it, active management will get us to old growth functions a lot faster than just leaving the forest to its own devices. And I'd like to add to that a little bit. Um, it's not just the old growth function. It, it, there, there are a lot of habitat benefits that, that occur much more rapidly. Um, if you look at, the, you compare a plantation forest to um, what we're trying to achieve here, you're going to see a lot of the ecological benefits occur before you're going to see, obviously, these you know, 500 year old trees that literally just takes time. Um, but the understory development, the difference in habitat types that are available to wildlife, that those benefits can occur fairly rapidly. They, those things don't take, you know, generations that they, they, they occur in, in decades or less. Um, so I, I just want to point that out that that not, you know, this work is not just for the future. Some of this, some of the benefits are going to be experienced, you know, fairly early on. I think I, I would just add that, you know, having seen some other uh, thinnings that have been done by Kitsap County under Arno's uh, guidance, you know, you, you can tell that they're, you're going for that healthy, mature, old tree forest. Uh, if you know, you should go, go walk around in them. You'll see, you can really just, if you go and walk through those, you can see the thinning and the replanting and the species diversification that's happening right now in other parks, um, which will happen, I'm assuming in Port Gamble, assume, assuming staff and elected officials remain uh, uh, conscientious about uh, the future, then yeah, we would be heading toward a nice, um, mature uh, forest, but that, that again, it goes back to the education piece and making sure that uh, the, the next generations care as, as much as we do. Okay, next question. Will there be clear cutting along logging road 1100? Arno, maybe you can answer this. This might be one we have to get back to, but 
Uh, no. <laughs> Anything in the shoreline original sh first part of the park, the shoreline block, is it's really some of it's second growth. Some of it is uh, plantations that have been described. Uh, but no, there's there's no there's no plans. Would be no plan in any plan. We the county owns those trees and clear cuttings off the table. Okay. Thank you. Next question: What plans are being made to address controlling invasive species, especially Scotch broom? Not sure what plans we have in place right now, Arno, or if that's something that needs to be developed. Uh, yeah, I think it's been addressed, the whole idea of getting literally an army of volunteers out there to, to work on it. I know that that's one of the critiques of, of my program is, you know, that it introduces more light and we have more scotch broom. Um, but it's, you know, it, 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 and I'm not going to blame anyone in particular, but it's, it's a human caused uh, result of, you know, it was introduced. But, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. I have some ideas that I'm looking at. We've tried a, a, a variety of different treatments at uh, several of our parks. And, uh, and really more work needs to be done. Uh, and there's some different ideas about it. There's actually uh, a little bit of scholarship on the subject too. Research has been done on it, but we're not going to use chemicals. It has to be physical or mechanical, really. And then, of course, the, the ultimate thing, and this goes with uh, Himalayan blackberries, and that is, is shade. Uh, Scotch broom doesn't thrive in the shade, nor do blackberries thrive in the shade. They're weakened and eventually die out. Some people don't believe that, but I, I've seen the evidence of it. Great. Thank you. And... Hans, we have a question directed to re requesting a copy of those two documents you referenced earlier. So if, I don't know if that's something you can provide and then I can- Yeah, sure. I can, those. I'll, it, it's just one uh, report, but I can give that to you. The, 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 um, the, GL, the land survey and the, the timber cruises are available through I think the state's archives, I don't have copies, like full copies of those um, in our, in our um, records, but I can provide the report that is based on that. Okay, yeah, and I'll, I'll go ahead and put a link to that on our webpage. Uh, I have a question here asking who the representatives on the steering committee are. Um, I, I can go ahead and answer that. We have Don Willott, Mark Shorn, and Catherine Thompson, and they are, uh, definitely uh, representing many, many folks. So I, I would suggest if, if you know of those three folks, feel free to uh, get in touch with them um, and we'll have contact information for the parks department as well on the webpage. Uh, next question, I, again, this one's for you, Hans. Uh, the, the distance from Bankful in the chart you provided, is that in feet? Uh, meters. Meters. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next question. What can be done following clear cuts that will happen in the park in the future to add diverse non-invasive plants that are native in addition to the trees that will be planted? Something that does better than scotch broom and other unwanted plants. David, I had dropped something uh, to the previous response, but I think it got moved. And I think, you know, Kirk's point that immediately upon the thinning there needs to be the site restoration plan that goes with it, which includes the understory. And that's where I really think the service corps um, being set up agreements with those groups, if you're not familiar with the Conservation Corps or Washington Service Corps, so that those kind of first two seasons, you have immediately resources uh, to help with whatever section you're working on so that that can keep it immediately under control goes a long way, but it just 
to the point, setting up how and when those different areas are going to be handled, and then the monitoring and mitigation being right there with the work when it gets accomplished. And from a site restoration standpoint, you know, replanting those sites immediately, in particular with trees, and even planting at a relatively high density, you know, we may still be coming back and planting at uh, what's considered an industrial density of 350 trees per acre. But the reason for that is to recolonize that site quickly to avoid uh, invasive species getting in and getting a foothold. If we can get that site reestablished at a high density, uh, we then have the option to come back and do the kind of thinning we need to later and adjust species, adjust docking densities. But the important thing is to recolonize that site very quickly. Another part of that, of course, is choosing the right tree species. And this is becoming increasingly uh, important uh, because of climate change. The historic species that were on this site may not be suitable for the future. As we go into a drying uh, climate, uh, looking at more uh, dry site adapted species, uh, Douglas fir, oak, madrone, uh, maple, pines, you know, things like that. We may also begin, may also need to um, accept that some of these sites will not be forest. Uh, they may go into prairie habitat. Uh, it really, we have to take a look at the soils and then understand what kinds of species will thrive on these sites uh, under future climate regimes. Thank you. Um, okay, so next question. What is the status of purchasing trees? How much has been raised and what are the prospects for the purchase? This might be pretty difficult for most folks to answer, but. Uh, I'll, I'll attempt that. Um, I've been acquiring trees every year to do some planting in the areas where I've done thinning and that occurred in the in the shoreline portion of Port Gamble Forest Heritage Park. Um, one of the questions that sort of ties to this is, could we be introducing all other trees than uh, Douglas fir when the trees are planted after the clear cut harvest that occurs under the timber deed? And we could, but it, for me, it was a logistical problem. I need to know what they're going to do, when they're going to do it. And I need to have advanced uh, information so that I can arrange and order trees and provide those trees. Um, and uh, so we have a more diverse stand growing on that site, just like Kirk was saying, we want it to be occupied, especially to mitigate the, the strength of uh, invasives. Um, and and we're, we're kind of looking at that as part of the pre-commercial thinning that we know we're gonna to need to do. That may be the first opportunity because I don't think we get away from that. And pre-commercial just means it's overstocked and you're gonna go in and remove some of the trees. And there always is a certain amount of natural imp, uh, re, re, uh, hemlock and in some cases pine and hardwoods that, that come in on the site, whether it's uh, birds and other wildlife that brings the seed in or it blows it in. And so there's an opportunity when you do pre-commercial thinning to uh, remove only Douglas fir and, and reserve all the other species of trees that are out there. And I'll just elaborate on that a little bit further. I, I think we'll provide a response online to, to all of these questions, but to that specifically, uh, nothing has been formally uh, agreed upon between any of the parties and Rainier. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. Next question, how is the new archeological research on Pacific Northwest indigenous forest gardens being considered in an overall healthy forest recovery plan? That might be something uh, we have to look into and get back to. Okay, next question. Are there benefits to leaving some open er some areas open, such as meadows? Would an open area help with fire suppression, bird and pollinator habitat? 
for recreation value, the open area might provide opportunities for wildlife viewing. Yeah, I, I think that had been already touched on, but in some areas where the soil conditions aren't conducive for forest tree establishment, consider prairies and then really diversify your structure by adding meadows and other ecosystems in these forests. Thank you. Next question, could we introduce camas? Well, again, it's going to get back to a soils question. You know, if there are soils that will support it, uh, camas tends to grow on rocky soils, uh, glacial till. Uh, Arno indicated that the, the site class or the, the productivity of soils is very high, so I'm not sure how much of it really is uh, comprised of glacial till. Uh, typically, it's a lower productivity site, but, you know, this question kind of goes back to the, the prior one that was just asked, you know, about uh, restoring ethnobotanical uh, plants and, you know, other uh, forest management techniques that have been used for centuries on this site. And I think that'd be a wonderful thing to look at. I mean, right now, we're all we're talking about really are trees and invasive species, but there's a tremendous diversity of other plants that have edible qual uh, qualities, medicinal qualities that are endemic uh, to this area. And, you know, either committing a portion of the forest as a demonstration site for managing for uh, non-timber forest products or ethnobotanicals could be a wonderful community exercise. And really, if you don't mind me using the term, exploit the inherent diversity uh, of Northwest forests. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity and could see a, a small you know, task force taking a look at that and finding just the right site uh, to manage for those kinds of other, you know, non-timber, if you will, uh, benefits. I would add that there is some site for land out there that need, would need, we should look at for those kinds of opportunities also. Some of those, some of those studies, I think that was referenced in the question, you know, some of the, the processes were that the, 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 the indigenous folks that were here and are here today uh, were doing was with hazelnuts and, and deciduous trees like that that produced food crop that was important for the wildlife, but also those kind of deciduous trees in the mid and understory uh, can help uh, retain more moisture in the, in the, in the system, which is really important for uh, fire mitigation as well. So that is a really interesting uh, thought. Thanks. Arno, uh, a little bit further elaboration on the question with invasives earlier. Um, there's been noticed uh, scotch broom invasion from the areas that have been thinned on the shoreline block. How are we managing invasive species after interrupting soils? Uh, only what, what work I've done and what volunteers have been doing, yes. It's not everywhere, but it, it, is, it is significant. Um, we're, we're actually, you know, quite honestly, we're going through a process of reorganization with a new parks director. And I think that we'll be addressing that. Uh, so I think we can plan for that. That's my intent. I, I'm actually concerned about some of the areas where clear cutting has occurred and it's been reforested. The trees have been planted and the Scotch room is very, very vigorous. Uh, the point where it, it needs to be dealt with in order for those trees to actually survive. It's not, we're not talking vast areas, but there's pocked places. And uh, in a drive around I did, I observed that. So I'm, I'm well aware of the problem uh, along roads and in, 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 in the interior of some of those areas then, yes. Thanks, next question. Are we considering the Jens Jensen processes for forest restoration? His work on the subject from the 1950s suggests prototype areas of ideal indigenous healthy woods, a transect with all species defined, replicated in modules across a large forest area. I think that might be one we have to get back to. Okay. Next question, will we be looking at attempting to get some future seedlings with some additional genetics from hemlocks or cedars from south of here in Oregon? So they'll be similar to our area's natives, but 
may have more temperature resilience since they are from areas that are already experiencing higher temps and periods of higher temps and drier conditions. I can answer just experimentally, we're starting to do uh, that type of planning in the county. And I'd be interested, and, and again, I, I would uh, ask for Arno and Kirk and, and Hans's recommendation on that, but I think that's a great idea to start at least on a small scale, beginning to experiment and see how these Southern genes or these Eastern genes uh, fare, fare uh, well in these uh, hotter, drier summers. And I'll just add to that, the Olympic National Forest is starting to work in that area. So they're, they've changed some of the recommendations for where they, where they get seed for, for their planting. So um, yeah, I, I do think that, that it's probably a, a really smart planning. There's a great website out there that's a resource for this called the Seed Lot Selection Tool. And if you type in seed lot selection tool, I forget if it's .com or .org, but you'll find it eventually. Just Google that term. Uh, it's a computer model that shows uh, you know, what area uh, of a southern latitude will be more comparable, say, to, to the northwest in 80 years. And it helps you then identify where you should be buying your seedlings uh, if you want seedlings that are adapted to the climate that will be here uh, in 80 years. And uh, Janice mentioned a study that's, that's happening. Uh, my organization, in partnership with the uh, Mountain to Sound Greenway, have also put in um, uh, a pilot project uh, testing out seedlings from southern provinces. And it's called the Stossel Creek uh, Restoration Project. If you look at our website, nnrg.org, you'll find information on this study we planted about a year and a half ago and are looking at the success of seedlings, but a very relevant uh, strategy for beginning to adapt uh, new forests to the changing climate. Thanks, Kirk. All right, so we have many more questions and unfortunately we are out of time. I am going to be saving these questions just for everyone's reference. We'll be sharing these with the panelists and we will make sure that we have answers and those will be provided on the webpage. Uh, to close, thank you to all of our uh, panelists so much. This was very helpful to our team as well as hopefully to many of the folks on the call. And thank you to those attending this call. Hopefully this was a valuable session. Um, if you haven't done so, please visit portgambleforestpark.com. That is the webpage we've established for the master plan process. Uh, sign up for email updates. And if you're interested, our next virtual open house where we'll be digging into the challenges and opportunities in the park will be on June 22nd from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Thanks everyone. And uh, we'll go ahead and close it there. <laughs>